not sure who I'm talking to altogether, but I was uh, introduced to this on the basis that um, there might be a lot of people, a lot of audience, a lot of background. And uh, certainly I'm trying to keep it light, but I'm also trying to, to talk about uh, this area from an external perspective because we can get very close to it ourselves when we're, uh, when we're working with it every day. We understand why we're doing what we're doing and so on. And yet there's a world out there full of people and those people are afraid of a lot of the things that we're talking about. So when we talk about autonomous vehicles, when we talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, robots, these are all things which uh, Joe Public uh, quite reasonably sees as a threat. They're taking, they're taking our jobs. They're going, the media uh, are telling this story, the press are uh, pushing it out, the politicians are repeating it, um, the uh, general perception of the public is let's blame something and we might as well blame robots. So it's important that we, that we get some sort of um, foot on reality here. And so I've taken a, a stand back a little bit and talking about robotics. So anyway, robots have been around for a little while and this guy, um, Leonardo da Vinci, seems to be credited with a lot of uh, inventions. I think he sketched some things together, but I guess that, uh, that a suit of armor was something that, that uh, they had around in those days and they probably had them on display because they had fancy suits of armors. And this guy probably had a bit of a joke because when people would lean across to look at this suit of armor, the arm would move. And you can see from the complicated electronic structure which is inside it, this is a sophisticated robot. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't called a robot in those days, it was an autonomer. Now the actual term robot was first used uh, by, uh, in 1922 by a guy from uh, Czechoslovakia and roboto meaning servitude apparently. But the, the idea of robot then emerged from 1922 where the, re where the replacement of automation with robot became popular. And so the concept then of robot as a humanoid thing originated at about that time and its objective was servitude. Now nobody's defined it in any kind of way, um, but, the, but this is as good a definition as you're likely to find on it. Well of course Metropolis, this is probably the robot that most of us know, uh, it's a lady robot, in case you hadn't worked it out for yourself. And uh, 1927, she appeared uh, as the first animated robot on, on uh, screens. And, uh, and I think it was probably, in its way, part of the cultural acceptance of robots as being something which was there. You know, here we had a, an animated persona and it was walking around and it was doing things and somehow society accepted that this is, this is on the cards. From 1927, we were going to have robots sometime. Now, not everything is quite as it seems. And I think that there is, we're, we're quite guilty about this and looking outside at the demonstrations that we've, we've seen today, especially the ones from SoftBank, these robots are very appealing. They look at you in the eye. They encourage you to feel like you're interacting with them. They encourage you to feel that you're acting with a human entity. And yet, inside the, um, the eye cub is a thing like that, a pair of eyes which looks back at you. It could easily be, this is from, uh, I'm not sure what the film is called, but nevertheless, you can, you can look above the waist and you have an appealing set of eyes and then something goes decidedly unnervy below. But what it also does, of course, is it questions ourselves. What do we see in humans? Because as humans, we quite literally um, take things at their face value. When I look at you, I don't see a series of skeletons sitting in the room. I see people and you all have some kind of commonality with me. I understand how you think, I understand how you, you work. We might have slight differences, but in the main, you all behave like people. And I think that that means that we don't need to think inside the physical entity at all. So the, the physical side is not very pretty. You know, nice pair of eyes, but this is what's behind them, you know, and it's behind them on all of us. And the, the optical nerve connects us to this great 
grey mass which exists between our ears but we all pretend isn't there. Um, and we're driven with servos and motors. We just happen to be in the shape of, uh, of muscles. You know, this is, this is the way that we work. And I'm going to go back to the previous slide a bit. Because we assume so much about what a robot can do simply because it looks humanist. And it's this uncanny valley term which you've, you've probably come across if you're in this area and, and not. But I think it's not just whether it looks human. It's whether we interpret it as being human is the thing we have to be careful of. Now, this one, of course, you will be familiar with. iCub is a childlike humanoid robot. I don't know how to say this kindly. Rubbish. <laughs> It's not a robot at all. It's just a collection of mechanical objects connected by servos and motors. It's got cameras. It doesn't have a brain. And yet somehow we attribute that robot, that baby, as having characteristics which are human. In fact, that posed um, picture on the front cover of uh, Angelou's book is lying. It suggests that that robot is crawling, and it never crawls. It's, it's fastened by an umbilical to the, to the table. It is not mobile. Um, yet we, we're creating this image, and this image is part of the thing that the population believes we're actually doing. We are creating robots which are capable of doing all of this, and it's scary because they can take my jobs, they can drive my car, they can... They can take on all of the things, including childminding, education, and everything else like that. We don't need people anymore because robots are so much better at it than we are. <clears throat> now, getting a little bit more sophisticated, but not still very much. I mean, the, this simple feedback loop over on the left-hand side, and I mustn't wander too far from the microphone, um, really is, is, is a simple description of what's going on inside any uh, uh, control network. This particular one has a requirement over on the left box which says a reference traje tra trajectory, which is what you want the thing to do. There is a neural network which is basically going to decide how to map that requirement onto some kind of actions. There is a mobile robot, and I, don't, I apologize for the words on all of these, they're somebody else's, but nevertheless that's the part of the system which moves. And then, of course, there's a feedback loop which says, did it move in the way that you expected it to move? And, uh, and if there was an error, then the error, of course, needed to be corrected in the same way. Now, in essence, it doesn't matter whether the, you implement that control loop biologically or using electronic software. Uh, you should be slightly concerned at this point being a human because you can choose a soft, wet um, neuron or you can choose a rather harder, either electronic or software or combination of neurons to produce a network which is going to do that functionality. It raises questions about just how different we are from machines. Um, I'm not going to go there. I know what I believe. <clears throat> anyway, the brain versus technology then. Just where are we on technology against the, uh, what, the, the, what evolution has given us between our ears? one and a half uh, kilograms of um, wet squidgy stuff dissipating about 20 watts, which is about the size of a small light bulb. Uh, it has 100 billion biological neurons in there, roughly 20 billion of which are in the wrinkly, brainy stuff on the outside. Um, and around 10,000 connections per neuron. This is, this is a hugely complicated vehicle. And if you've got one, you're very lucky, because this is the most powerful machine that has ever been created. And we've got one between our ears, so the best, best thing to do is to learn how to use it, because everybody does know how to program this thing, which is a wonderful thing to do, because most of the other neural networks that we've got, nobody has a clue how to program them. <clears throat> So the Spinnaker machine, um, there's an example of it talked about earlier in one of the research studies, but it's a spiking neural network. Um, it emulates around one billion neurons. So that's a thousand million for those of us who are not familiar with the numbers. 
real-time neurons using special electronics and software. So it's not biological, it's definitely hard. It uses electrons in a, uh, a transistor-like way. Um, it dissipates around 40 kilowatts, which is around the sort of energy required to power a small factory these days. Um, and it weighs around a tonne. So it's not exactly portable, certainly not portable between the ears. Um, so Spinnaker neuron is about 200,000 times less power efficient than the biological neuron. We haven't a clue how to make it 200,000 times more power efficient, just as a good starting point. And nobody knows, although Spinnaker, and I will come back to it, nobody knows how to use or to program more than a few percent of the neurons which are in Spinnaker. The neurons which are in Spinnaker, it's like having a great big box of Lego. Without a plan, what are you going to do with it? It's wonderfully capable. It can do all sorts of things. I've got the same number of Lego bricks as you've got brains in, uh, neurons in your brain, but it doesn't help me to build a brain. It's just a lot of Lego bricks. So it's a very useful starting point, but until we can learn how to use it, we're not actually being able to exploit it. Now, the iCOB uses around 10 to 100,000 electronic neurons. I don't seem to be able to get a good, clear answer on that, but nevertheless, it's not in the millions. Uh, in a deep neural network, and it's implemented in an NVIDIA AI box at the end of, the, um, of an umbilical cord from the robot. In other words, the brain isn't inside iCub, it's outside. It lives in a cupboard. Nobody notices it under a desk. Um, <coughs> iCub itself has no intelligence. It's just an input-output device with a cute wrapper. Cute being the operative word. So this is Spinnaker. This is what Spinnaker looks like. Over to the left, there is a, something of a chip plot. It shows 18 ARM CPUs, so it's got, uh, it's got 18 processors in it, uh, in the chip. Now, you may think that that sounds quite a lot, but if you've got a smartphone, you've probably got 10 processors in your smartphone. So it's about the sort of intelligence level of uh, an integrated circuit about eight years ago when it was designed. Uh, that's what it looks like if you were to open up the package. You'd see, actually, it's quite interesting because... If you look in the center part of it, the gold area there, the gold area in the background is the processors, the 18 processors. The one, the small rectangle on top of it is a memory chip, actually sat on top of the processor chip, so it makes a very compact package, very sophisticated. And if you put 48 of them together on this board, you end up with a capability of around a million neurons. And if you put them all together in this big rack, you end up with 500,000 ARM processors versus the 10 in your smartphone. It's implementing around 500 million neurons, which is half of what the full implementation of uh, Spinnaker will be. So they've only built this so far. It's got another five more bays to go. Um, and it's worth in um, computational value, intelligence value, a few mouse brains. So we've moved up from a small insect brain I can't even say that word. Somebody else might be better at it if they came from a biological background. A million neurons about the size of a pond snail, about the capability of a pond snail. And we're headed towards a mouse brain. The full implementation of Spinnaker is around 1% of, uh, of the neural capability of the human brain. So we've still got 100 times you need to put together a box a hundred times the size of that implementation of Spinnaker to get to the same number of core neurons. And then, of course, you still have the problem of how do you configure it, which is a major problem. Now, iCub's external brain. Most pictures of iCub don't show the umbilical cord coming from the back. Uh, they don't show it standing on a, on a frame because it can't stand up on its own. Um, they, they conveniently make it look more like a person. Uh, because it's more appealing that way. Sideways on, a little bit less appealing. And it's less appealing, perhaps, to discover that its brain is over here in this box. Um, so at the end of the umbilical connected to it. The robot developers, not surprisingly, want to show what it looks like. And it's made to look cute. But that same cuteness is scaring away the children. The people outside don't... Um, don't know that this is an I.O. box. They don't know that this is an, an, uh, an unsophisticated interface. 
they think of it as an intelligent being. And that's a scary thought because we can now make mechanical humans which are capable of doing all of these different things that humans are doing at the moment then what's the hope for humanity? That's why it's important to understand the limitations of these things as well. Uh, <coughs> robots are automata. They're still automatic machines. They're still fundamentally the same as that suit of armor with a bit of cable making one of the arms wiggle. They've not moved on a great deal in the sense of, in, in the, sense of the object itself. What's happened here is there's an awful lot more sophistication gone on in that box but it's still not a very complex box compared to the brain between your ears. So these robots are all good at specific tricks. That makes it sound rather more limited, doesn't it? These are not so clever, sophisticated things. They're just, they have a trick. There's one party piece that they do, and they're particularly good at that party piece, but ask them to do something else outside that domain, they're nowhere. They don't know it. So they're not like humans. They can do, humans can do lots of things. Computers driving the, uh, uh, the brains of these robots are quite limited. Now, this is the sort of thing, and I'm not asking you to read the words on this, but this is the sort of thing that you can now put inside um, a box. You could think about put it in, putting it inside um, the, as the controller, a reasonably smart um, sophisticated AI capability. Uh, this one processes six video streams and will combine them and do image recognition on them real time. It costs about £700. So you could put one of these inside a car without too much difficulty. You couldn't put one inside your phone. It would just be too expensive. And apart from anything else, it is actually physically big. This is, there's 256 GPU cores here two 64-bit arms and four 32-bit uh, arms. They're quite significant power there and eight gigabytes of memory. And it's all going like stink, 58 gigabyte, gigabytes per second data rate. All of that means they've drawn it alongside a battery, but that's not to illustrate that it's battery powered. It's just to give you an indication of the size. This thing is gonna consume power. So you can't put it into something which is going to be solar powered, for example. <clears throat> now, that was substantial numbers of um, neurons. But at this end, you can actually do quite a bit with rather less than that. Phil Culverhouse from here um, was working on this 30 years ago. I know I was coming down here and talking to him in those days. He was talking about plan plankton recognition. Just using a few hundred electro electrical neurons and able to detect the nature and count the nature of planktons in samples of water. This is still in use today. It's still being um, used for health monitoring of the oceans. And I think it's fantastic. It tells you what neural networks are capable of doing. And it it's a practical example of it. <clears throat> now, if you're going to teach an artificial intelligence, the idea comes over somehow that um, if we can teach these artificial uh, intelligences to do all of these different things, then all of the things will be cumulative, much like teaching humans. Uh, you know, you don't t have to teach a human to recognize a cat on a particular uh, application if you want to count cats, because you've already taught the human to recognize a cat when it was a baby. It knew about the cat. The cat wanders around the room. It doesn't have any problem recognizing cats. So you can show it 10 years from now a picture and say, I want you to count the cats in that scene. You don't have to tell it about all this background. The background that people have been illustrating today. Um, you want to make a sandwich. You already know what a sandwich is. You've, gr you've grown up knowing what sandwiches are. So when, you're, when you eventually go to university and have to make your own sandwich and you can't get your mum to do it for you anymore, then you you at least have the basics of an idea. It's slices of bread and cheese, you just don't know where to buy them or how much they cost. But that's a different problem to be overcome. It's not fundamentally to making a sandwich. So you can train networks by exposing them to millions, 
frequently tens of millions of examples and noting essentially which are the, no the neurons which are being used, which are the connections which are most active and what are the weightings that you should be applied to those connections because the vast majority of them are irrelevant. Now the good news about that is if you don't want your system to learn then replicating only the relevant nodes and the relevant weightings it's very easy. They can be very much simpler, which is why you can now have basic speech recognition on your smartphone. Because actually basic recognition of speech is not that difficult. Once you've got, you've created the neural network and trained it, we're not adapting it anymore. But if you want to incorporate learning, and of course we can all do learning, we've got it in our heads, we know how to do it, uh, we adapt and change uh, we can have a, a dual carriageway where there was previously a single carriageway. Or we can have roadworks where previously there was, there was a clear road. We adapt, we change. But if you want your machine to handle situations like that, you've got to train it to handle situations like that. You can't expect it to be adapted unless the adapted machine is very, very much bigger. So that little card is not going to be much use if you're going to create an adaptive brain. <clears throat> so adding the learning ability makes a machine much more complicated. Of course this is the thing which is bothering people right now and you hear it on pretty well every news broadcast. It's how autonomous vehicles are going to be taking over. They're going to be taking over everything. Um, all of our cars we won't be able to drive anymore. In fact um, you know, humans are so dangerous that uh, the sooner we can be taken off the road and replaced by a robot the better. Um, all of these things are, you know, they're in the press at the moment. And if you listen to uh, the Tesla uh, PR, then they're going to have a fully autonomous vehicle next year. You know, the reality is, actually, they're a very long way from that, but they don't realize it yet. But the population, uh, just ordinary people, they only relate what they hear. Uh, the politicians are just ordinary people who've got voted into, uh, into political positions. Uh, they also go along with the news. Most people out there are ne not technologists. They don't understand the, uh, the implications of technology, the details of technology. Um, not surprising, they don't need to. They're humans. Most humans treat things on their face value. Their smartphone works. They don't need to know what's inside the box any more than I need to know what's inside you when I'm talking to you. Um, so, a practical... Um, AI, automotive controller, neural network will have to be independent of the internet. You can't depend on having a connection to a big computer out there. Even if you drop the, the uh, connection briefly, then the car has to be self-sustained or the vehicle has to be self-sustained at that point. So that means its neural network will have to be capable of only a limited degree of learning it's never going to be able to learn to write poetry. It will never change its fundamental senses or core algorithms. It's not going to become changed from being an engineer to being a poet overnight, which a person could. Uh, so it's never got that degree of flexibility. It's going to have quite a limited degree of learning capability. Practically, um, it will be a fraction of a million real-time neurons. So that puts it into the context of something which is only a few times smarter than iCub. Cost, power, reliability will all have to be factors in this. It's one thing to demonstrate it in a lab as an example. It's a totally different thing to put it into production where it's going to be sold in the millions and is going to have to be still working after 10 years uh, and you're going to, going to have some sort of witch hunt if it breaks down when they all go searching for the person whose fault it was, the designer who didn't incorporate the appropriate protection at that point. Um, a similar intelligence then to a small insect or pond snail. That's the sort of capability we're talking about putting into an auto autonomous vehicle. Now, I'm sure that insects and small pond snails are much, much smarter than we think. Uh, they, do how, they do manage to find food, they manage to breed, they build nests if a nest is an appropriate thing. Um, they, they go about their business remarkably. There is no way we could make anything like that 
so we mustn't underestimate the capability. But it is nevertheless around 0.0001% of the capacity of the human brain we're talking about putting into our autonomous vehicles. So comparing the performance of an autonomous vehicle AI to the performance of the human brain is just a joke because the human brain is just so, so, so much better at uh, intelligent thinking and processing than the AI machine is. The problem is that the human brain finds driving so easy that it's susceptible to being distracted. I mean, you sit in the car listening to the radio, talking to your wife or husband, the kids arguing in the background, uh, there's a road change, there's road works, <coughs> um, the radio stops and somebody says there's an argument about whether that song is the best song of somebody else. You know, it's chaos all around you. And yet you're driving this car. And in the main, you're doing pretty well. Um, an, an, a, an autonomous vehicle won't be distracted, but it will never be able to handle the full spectrum of driving situations that you can. So the idea that you will be able to hand this over the control of this vehicle over in its entirety to an artificial brain with the, with the intelligence of a pond snail uh, is frankly rather scary because it's so improbable. So there is, however, lots of room for machine-human cooperation. We don't have to go for full autonomy, but we do have this whole business of you can't have human not involved in the loop because if you suddenly say, if the AI machine might be tempted to do, oh my God, over to you, I don't know what to do in this situation. And the person is reading a book, drinking a cup of coffee, whatever. They are not in a position to take over like that. So you can't, that, that whole business of how you handle machine-human cooperation is something which is a lot more important than I think people are giving credit for today. Because they kind of believe that it's a transition thing that we're going to go through. We're not going to go through it anytime soon. Uh, some AV performances, this came out in uh, IEEE MAG uh, back in January. Uh, there's a thing called the Deep 3D Box, George Mason University, USA. Um, it's interesting to find here that the universities are actually doing some of the best AI work for the uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, it correctly identifies and orientates 89% of cars but only 74% of bikes and only 59% of their orientation. So essentially only spots, there's only 74% of the bikes and actually hasn't got a clue where they're going because if it was 50% it would be guessing. So 59% is only marginally better than guessing. So what do we know about cyclists? They, co they pose a complex detection problem because they're relatively small, fast and heterogeneous and don't always obey the rules. Um, of course, they've not really gone far along that road because um, there's lots of other AVI problems there as well. Mixed precincts, cars, people, bikes, all mixed together. They're becoming more popular. Single track roads, can you imagine um, a Tesla going down some of these Devon roads? Don't know how it would handle those. Uh, dirt roads, these are roads without any edges on either side. They simply drive across uh, open territory. Human gestures. Now, not all of them are unpleasant, incidentally, but when, uh, when a car driver encounters a person, then frequently the person will do something like this. Now, car driver understands what that means. So does that mean to say they have to have a big sign on top of the car saying this is now driven by, um, by a computer, so there's no point in trying hand signals. They won't work. So any kind of gestures, let's say human gestures, will not be, will not be recognized. Weather, snow, lots of rain, they all cause a lot of problems. Uh, weather, wind blows trees down, you know. Uh, you know are, are the uh, autonomous vehicles even looking at the context of where it's going to drive, not just where it is? And roadworks. Roadworks have a habit of changing things quite suddenly. Uh, and incidentally, this business about the uh, auto autonomous vehicles being much more reliable and it being much safer it's interesting to note that there have been two to three fatalities in autonomous vehicles in a few million kilometers of road testing so far. Um, now that's uh, on the, only on the best roads, so it's only on good roads, and it's highlighted in the sense of, well, we've done millions of kilometers under, under these arguments, uh, these 
only few people have been uh, killed. Now, actually, if you go online, you can find that there are published figures for the fatality rates, and these are of the order of five per billion kilometers. And this is with human drivers handling all kinds of roads, not just the best kinds of roads. So actually, the human driver is way better than the uh, autonomous vehicle figures which are currently being pushed around. So I don't know where the idea has come from that, that, that uh, the future of that robotic uh, uh, contrivance is going to be much better than it is for the, uh, for the uh, human driver. Of course, the human driver is still very, very good. So industrial robots, then. These are the ones who I suppose are predominantly uh, stealing our jobs. Um, they're good at doing certain things. There they are. They're tricks again. They don't look like humans, incidentally, so arguably we shouldn't call these robots. We should call them automata again. So they're really all they're doing is repeating very repetitive processes, which they'll quite happily do day and night, lights on, lights off, um, until hell freezes over. They're good at handling weight, they're good at positioning things, they're good at manoeuvring things down complex routes to get, get seats into cars, for example. Get it wrong slightly and they'll open you a new door in your vehicle because they are irresistible forces. They're not so good at adapting, not so good at learning or anything beyond their design limits. They can't reach something which is just beyond their reach. They can't pick themselves up and walk across and get it if it's dropped off the conveyor belt. Um, they are quite limited, but they are autonomous. They're good at certain tricks. We mustn't knock that. But it does mean that if your job is a very repetitive job, then you are going to be replaced by something like this. So the idea of using that brain, that huge comp computation machine existing between your ears, is certainly not to be ignored. Of a similar nature, incidentally, is this thing, which I like because it's the... Um, and I've forgotten the name of it now, but it's the model of the planets and their orbits, and I think it's a, a fantastic example, but it's a computer. It just happens to be a mechanical computer, and it's very good at a certain trick, which is telling you where all the, the planets are in our solar system, reasonably accurately, not very accurately, but pretty good. And I think that it, its trick is, teaching, is showing you where the planets are. That's what it does. Don't ask it what the time is. That might be rather more difficult to do. So society's relationship with robots then. Now the three categories here, and it's worth thinking about these because we tend to think only of one of them, and that's the application. And this applies to an awful lot of things, not just to robotics incidentally. We only tend to think of the application of the technology. We don't talk about the creation of it, and we don't talk about the installation, configuration, programming, and maintenance of it. These are the bottom two are real big professional jobs. That middle one is where the science is done, and it's where the engineering is done. We know that that's a big job. Even when we know what the science is, the amount of effort that's necessary to engineer it, to produce a product, is a very big job. If we looked at well, careers prospects, people tend to say, well, think of it as computers. Use of computers. You know, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, that's what you do with a computer, isn't it? Uh, creating computers, oh, that was done by, I don't know what, IBM 40, 50 years ago. Hasn't really moved on since. Integrated circuits, well, we designed those, didn't we? It's done. Now, those areas which are down here are, of course, where we are going to build our career. It may be in the, I'm not building my career anymore, I've done that. <coughs> the... Um, it may be that they are um, going to be installing or developing the original technology, or it may be that they are actually involved with the exploitation of it. It's very wrong, for example, to consider that manufacturing is not a, design, a challenging technology uh, uh, in its own right, because m making and manufacturing something like that integrated circuit that I showed you a few moments ago, which had the memory chip on top of it, you can't do that with yesterday's assembly technology. And that assembly technology had to be developed by, or has to be developed by, somebody. And that's something, that somebody has got a profession doing that work. So there are lots and lots of professions in this lower space. As far as using robots are concerned, well, it started with the shovel and diggers. 
Diggers displaced the shovel. Wheelbarrows were replaced by conveyors. They used to dig dry, job, uh, dry docks with gangs of Irishmen with shovels and picks and wheelbarrows go into the Science Museum and there's a model of the creation of one of the big dry docks. And it's fantastic because you've got little, it's covered with little, little men with wheelbarrows. That's how they dug big holes. And we don't do it this way anymore. Those are robots. You know, a JCB is a robot. It's a power magnifier. Your car is a robot. It enables you to go fast. Your smartphone is a robot. It gives you communication over distance. It enables you to shout louder than you could ever achieve. It gives you better memory because a photograph is worth a thousand memories, if you like. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful use of robots. And these are the robots in life today. So my conclusions then. Robotics. Just automata, able to do particular and quite limited tricks. Let's not get them out of proportion. We're pretty good at them. There's a lot of cleverness that can go on in it, We're not derating any of the work that you're doing. But I'm just gotta, we've just got to make sure that the public knows that this is what it is. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence is a useful tool to, tool to perform sophisticated seeming data processing and analysis. You can use AI to find um, terrorism activities in act activities looked across the wider spectrum of the network, but only if you've taught the network to do it beforehand, which presumably means that the person who is teaching the network to do it already knows how to do it. And people, brains, are very good at pattern recognition. It's one of our greatest strengths, actually, is pattern recognition. So before we've got too carried away with that, the pattern matching ability of the human brain is still way above the, uh, the capabilities that um, uh, machine learning can offer and artificial intelligence can offer and will be so for many years. Society then must not get carried away with the hype around AI, AV, robotics and uh, robots and robotics and it must learn to understand the difference between science and science fiction. We're dealing with science fiction here, uh, and with the, the people who are keen to have anti-gravity machines, they're keen to have automatic, autonomous vehicles. Doesn't mean to say that it's possible to do any of them, and it's certainly not going to be an easy thing to do any of them. Hype, market, demand, or public wishes don't make the laws of physics any easier to manipulate. Doesn't matter how popular it would be to have an anti-gravity machine, uh, we could even have a budget for it, we could even draw a time plan for it, but we're just not going to get one. Um, uh, perpetual motion is another area as well. <coughs> Career opportunities, though, we tend to think that all the best jobs have gone. We listen too much to that PR ourselves rather than realising where the, there are lots of exciting opportunities. We're nowhere near to knowing all there is to know about the laws of physics and their application. We've got some good starting points, but we can go an awful lot further. There are many generations of career opportunities for anybody with a brain. And that's most people, actually. Imagination, application, tenacity, sincerity, teamwork, ingenuity, communications, and hand-eye skills are the things that make us into good scientists and engineers. So not everybody has all those, but maybe there's opportunity for more people to be doing stuff in there. Incidentally, I'm very keen to emphasize that this is not a gender issue. This is not gender, religion, or, um, or, or anything. You know, it's not sizest or ageist. If you've got these, this characteristic, then you're needed. At which point, I will stop. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.